This live stream broadcast is brought to you by the efforts of Diabetes Mine, a gold mine of straight talk and encouragement, and also by Tidepool, stewards of your data, proudly nonprofit, and by the Night Scout Foundation, open source, open data, open hearts. We would like to thank Amy Tenderich for hosting the event and Howard Look for adding Mark Wilson to the event from a recommendation by Brandon Arbiter. This live recording took place on June 10th, 2016 in the historic district of New Orleans. Today's broadcast is episode 3 of Are We There Yet? in T1 Tech. Mark's presentation is on open APS and do-it-yourself diabetes. Diabetes Mind presents D-Data Exchange on the verge of an artificial pancreas. We are not waiting. Um, okay, so as we go on our journey here through the different uh, point of views of what's happening in the artificial pancreas development world, we are now going to shift to the DIY community, and I want to welcome Mark Wilson. He's the tech guy. <laughs> you fix this while I introduce you. So Mark, if you don't know him, is a freelance software developer from San Francisco. He's been programming since he was 10, and he has had diabetes since he was uh, 14, type 1, of course. Uh, he spent three years on the web team at Yelp.com, where he rebuilt the search page and created uh, mapping and data visualization tools. Um, he actually has a, a BA in Chinese from Yale, and he's the creator of something called Urchin CGM, the unopinionated, ridiculously configurable human interface to Night Scout, which um, because he's such a smart guy, I'm going to let him explain that. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm honored to be here. Um, imagine having diabetes is like having to drive a car. You've got to keep the car moving at the right speed. You've got to keep it in the right lane. Driving a car is not complicated at all. What makes it complicated is that you never leave the car. You're driving this car 24 hours a day. And this car I'm talking about isn't just like you're pumping your CGM, it's your dosing formulas, your rules of thumb for different foods. Your experience of daily life always involves the, the awareness that no matter what else you're doing, you're also driving this car. It's your permanent reality. But if you learn to use the car really well, you can get into a flow and learn to focus on other things. And that's how we all learn to live with diabetes. That part's up to you. How often you check the speedometer, what kind of adjustments you make, it's totally personal. There are some things that are less up to you, and that includes the design of some of your tools. And let's say your dashboard is upside down. It makes it very inconvenient to check some of the data that you need to be checking a lot. You start to wonder, I'm doing my best to drive this car. What could this car be doing to make my drive easier? So you look into this uh, upside down dashboard situation. It turns out you can fix it. You're going to have to hotwire the car. <laughs> so you worry, I don't know how to hotwire a car. I don't, I don't have time to learn. And anyway, I don't, I don't want to damage my car. What do you do? Well, spoiler, I opened my car. I'm going to talk about why I'm using an open source artificial pancreas system, what it's been like to use it, take a step back and say, what's this open APS thing for? And then, what's this DIY diabetes thing for? First, how did I get here? For my entire adult life, I've had this ideal feedback loop of what I would do if I had continuous access to my diabetes data. But it was more or less impossible, for as long as I can remember. I saw this thing called Night Scout, but it involved an Android phone and a bunch of wires. I was like, that's not for me. I guess this is the reality I'm stuck with for now. Then I met this guy. His name is Ben West. Maybe you've heard of him. <laughs> he gave me this device, which let my iPhone talk directly to my pump, which was running my CGM at the time. And with that, my mind was blown. Because it meant that maybe I could even achieve my ideal feedback loop. So I went nuts. I built this tool that sits in the top of my computer so that while I'm working at my computer, I can see what my blood sugar is. I built this watch face so that I can glance at my wrist and see a graph and what my insulin on board is. So I can very quickly make a decision and move on. And this was awesome. I felt like I finally had the control I always wanted. I saw this open APS thing and I was like, well, that's insane. Don't need a computer deciding my insulin for me. Don't need to carry a computer around on my hip. In fact, I finally have the control I always wanted. But then I had an epiphany. I went on a backpacking trip and when you go in the wild for a few days, the whole point is being present. It's really obvious where your attention is going. The entire time, my attention was going to this awesome feedback loop I had built, but it didn't feel awesome. It felt like my mindfulness, my most scarce resource, was going to something that did not deserve it. Turns out the ideal is not a feedback loop that involves me. The ideal is that the loop be closed. So that's what I did. I started using a closed feedback loop artificial pancreas. I have a 
Raspberry Pi, which is a portable computer. It talks to my Dexcom receiver, and it also talks to my insulin pump via an antenna to read insulin history and send commands. So what's my experience been like? I'll start off with some graphs, get those out of the way. So here's my CGM distribution. This is before I started using any of this fancy tech. Every vertical line here is a different week. The middle section is the middle 50% of my readings, and the outer section is the middle 80%, so from the 10th to the 90th percentile. And you can see my results with the Minimed Enlight were not ter terrible, they were not great. When I added Night Scout and Dexcom, that was that feedback loop, I saw a dramatic improvement in the range of my blood sugar values. Then when I added OpenAPS, the additional benefit is a little more subtle. Uh, first of all, the high end of the range has been trimmed. That's those you know, drift away highs that you catch an hour or two too late. Uh, OpenAPS notices those and catches them before they happen. And overall, the range is compressed. But I look at this graph and see I'm getting slightly better outcomes with significantly less work than I was doing with that super active participation in the feedback loop. But there is one area where the improvement is super dramatic, and that's while I'm asleep. So these are the same readings, but only between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m. So you can see that the range has been massively compressed while I'm sleeping. And this is how that happens. This is a very similar plot. I think this is called an AGP. Every bar here is an hour of the day, and it's all the readings taken across all days. So on the top is without, and the bottom is with open APS. You can see on the bottom left here, I still have type 1 diabetes. I go to sleep in a relatively wide range of blood sugar values, but no matter what trajectory I start the night on, while I'm asleep, the algorithm can gently nudge me back into range. That's that tightening you see between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m. So virtually every morning, I'm waking up around 100. So what's it like to wake up? Well, I usually look at my watch, which these days looks like this. On the top, you can see my CGM. It's pretty flat. But beneath the CGM, this is my basal rate history. Every five minutes, OpenAPS is looking at the deviations in my CGM and deciding that my basal rate should be slightly higher or slightly lower. I woke up one morning and I was like, how do I feel today? What's my day going to be like? Instead of, what's my blood sugar and how can I correct that? See, with diabetes, there's a lot you learn to accept. Yesterday I had a bad infusion set, but I can't complain about that. That's life with diabetes. Before I saw open APS, I didn't think my sleep was that bad. I was like, that's life with diabetes. Turns out it's not. You can change it. You can change this forever starting today. How am I making decisions on open APS? Let's say your blood sugar is 65. It's three less than the reading before. You seem to be decelerating into the drop, though, and your insulin on board is 0.3. So if you want to be 90 to 110 in an hour and a half, how many carbs should you eat? I have no idea. It's impossible. <laughs> what I would do now is I would eat slightly too much, and if I overcorrect and it looks like I'm going to spike, open APS will catch that spike and blunt it. So my highs are lower and my lows are higher. What was it like to build this system? Well, it goes something like this. Here's some instructions. They may not be complete, but as you follow them, here's how you can contribute back to them. And as you use the system, you may have issues, but if you manage to fix them, here's how you can contribute those fixes back. So one day, my partner said, you know, you're spending so much more time on your diabetes than you ever were before. <laughs> and that really caught me by surprise because that was the opposite of the goal. Uh, on the one hand, I couldn't argue with her. She was ready to go to bed, and I was hunched over my computer saying, five more minutes. But the way I saw it, things were so much better. Because the time I was spending making diabetes decisions had gone down so much. And this blue section, time spent troubleshooting, yeah, it's huge right now. <laughs> but that's great. The nature of technology is once you move something into the realm of technology, you can automate it. You can write code to make it go away, which it has. So today, it's a few moments of monitoring per day. You learn how it works and how it can fail. And though in that way, it's no different than your pump or your CGM. But then how do I trust OpenAPS? Well, safety is built into the design. All the adjustments are conservative. It never gives you a bolus. All it does is adjust your basal rate and only for the next 30 minutes. So if you walk away, you'll go back to your normal basal schedule. The limits are conservative. The adjustments are conservative. But most important to me as a software engineer, it's open source. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Given enough people reading the code, the odds of a fatal flaw go to zero. Here's the number of contributors the open APS documentation. So when you follow the instructions to build your open APS, 47 different voices have also read those instructions and contributed back to them. And here's how many people are using open APS. A year ago it was less than five and today it's 81. Every one of these gives me more confidence. It's not just some DIY contraption. It's an obvious solution. So that's been my experience with open APS. 
let's uh, stretch the canvas a little bit and say, what is this open APS thing for? To talk about that, I need to introduce the Fitbit scale. This is Fitbit scale, it's known to be inaccurate. So the one thing a scale is supposed to be good at, it's not very good at. <laughs> but people are paying over $100 for them because it has Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi means that as soon as you step on this device, immediately your data goes into the cloud. And because it's in the cloud and Fitbit has an open API, anyone you authorize can do whatever they want with your data. Novel things Fitbit did not see coming. I'll give you one example. This is a service called Beeminder. This is a service where you connect your credit card and your Fitbit scale. And you say, Beeminder, I weigh 180 pounds. But if I don't weigh 160 pounds in three months, charge me 100 bucks. Every day when I step on my scale, automatically my weight is plotted on this graph at Beeminder. And if it ever gets outside this green bound, charge me 100 bucks. And I love this example because it's something Fitbit knows it won't think of. Even if they did, they wouldn't invest in it. And yet it adds value to Fitbit's platform. So this is what we need in terms of a device that collects data from our bodies. And this is what we have with diabetes. So going from left to right here along the bottom, we have these devices, they're connected to our bodies. They talk to these readers. We can't talk to our devices directly usually. We have to go through something like this. And even those readers, we can't just use any software to talk to. Anyone who's had to dig out their five-year-old computer to use a Java applet to upload their pump data knows exactly what I'm talking about for these private protocols. Once they're on our phones or our computers, we still don't own our data. They generally go to private servers owned by the vendor. And it's not like we can authorize just any app to use that data. If you're a partner of the app, you can get access to it. This is a pretty sorry state of the world. Where does OpenAPS fit in? This OpenAPS thing I keep talking about is not an artificial pancreas. All it is is a platform with which you could build one. So in this world, OpenAPS sits here. It is a platform that gives you the ability to talk to your devices. What you do with that ability is up to you. Many of us end up using it to build closed loop systems, but that's just one application of it. So being a platform, that means several important things. The first is that it can be running on any hardware. I still use, oh, yeah. I still use the Raspberry Pi. Many people have switched to the much smaller Intel Edison. Some people are using an iPhone as the controller. Some people have moved the entire loop control onto a dedicated board. Also, being a platform, it means it gives you the ability to talk to your devices. It doesn't tell them what to do. That part's up to you. That's the dosing code. So there's not just one dosing algorithm which is open APS. There are many dosing algorithms being used. There's OREV0 by Dana and Scott, the most popular and the best documented. Open APS Dose by Chris Hanneman and Nate Ratcliffe. Gustav has been working on SimPancreas for over two years, and TinyAP is an attempt at a parameterless algorithm. Furthermore, being a platform, it's totally up to you how you interface with your data. Many people use Night Scout. It's recently been optimized to work with Open APS. Other people use Open APS Monitor. You can use an Apple Watch. You can use a Pebble Watch. The point is, OpenAPS serves many different needs in many different ways. And this ecosystem is just a preview of what you get when you make devices interoperable. This is what a real ecosystem looks like, and it's one that we had to force to exist. In that way, it's no different than this thing we call DIY diabetes. So taking one more step back, what is this DIY diabetes thing we keep talking about? Well, DIY diabetes addresses the same bleak picture of the world. And it has two main concerns. The first is the same concern that Jeff was talking about, which is getting the data out, getting access to the data. And this is an ongoing concern with DIY because you can't do anything until you have the data. So here's one example, it's called Night Scout. This is a deliberately overwhelming flowchart. I pulled it from the setup guide because every column here represents a different way of getting your data into Night Scout today. It doesn't matter if you have Dexcom, Medtronic, Freestyle, Libre, if it's connected by wires or wireless, iPhone, Android, someone has built through painstaking hours, some way to get your data into Night Scout because it's so important to have your data somewhere that's open, that you can view anywhere, on a phone, on a tablet. One more example, this is the Freestyle Libre. Very cool device, wear it for 14 days, never have to prick your finger, it's factory calibrated. Anytime you wanna know what your blood sugar is, just wave it over your arm, and it tells you here's your blood sugar now and here's what it's been. Very, very cool, there's just one thing. This reader doesn't send the data anywhere. You have to connect it to your computer by a wire. So some very clever people saw this and thought, well, that's the same NFC protocol my Android phone has. So this app is called Glimp. You can wave your Android phone over your arm. And as soon as you have your data on your Android phone, because it's connected to the internet, it instantly goes into the cloud. So you can see it on your wrist. Other people can see it on their computers. Some people thought this and said, that's amazing. But I have to wave my phone over my arm. 
What if I just built a device that sits on my arm and makes those same queries to the Freestyle Libre every few minutes, turning the Libre into a continuous glucose monitor? And I like this example because in the age of Night Scout and OpenAPS, you can't release a device like this and not have someone figure this out. <laughs> so there's ongoing, continuous work until we have interoperability to get the data out of the devices. But the point isn't to get the data. It's the point that the point is to build these new interfaces to it. And this is such a broad world, I can only scratch the surface, so I'm going to give a few examples. Uh, if you have continuous access to your pump data, then when an event happens on the pump like a bolus, you can configure Night Scout to send a push notification to your phone to find out about the bolus and how many carbs are taken. You can do the same thing for low reservoir alarms. And Night Scout has had this ability for two years. This is one component of LoopKit. It lets you bolus from your Apple Watch. But instead of just asking you for carbs, it says, are these carbs more like a lollipop, a taco, or a slice of pizza? Because when you're dosing insulin, carb absorption rate is super important. But no bolus wizard on any pump asks you the carb absorption rate. Mm -hmm. Temporary targets. We all know the idea of a target. But now I have an artificial pancreas. It's correcting to me something like 90 to 110. That's my target. But if I'm going for a run in three hours, maybe I want a temporary target of, I don't know, 120 to 160. I want it to expire in three hours. Do you think any of the APs shipping in 2018-ish are going to have temporary targets? Because I can go into my phone and do this on Night Scout right now. Mm -hmm. Finally, this is one of my projects, Urchin. And the unopinionated part of this name is very important because all the devices we use have a lot of opinions. What we hear alarms about. What the alarms sound like. What we should consider our maximum blood glucose. What time scale we should be looking at our blood glucose on. My goal with this was that I have no opinions. Build your own watch face. Put things wherever you want. Put whatever you want on it. And these are just four examples of the many layouts I've seen people come up with. And this is a very simple tool so far. And people have already come up with things I never would have thought of to do with this tool. This kind of configurability needs to become the standard. So I could have shown hundreds more examples. But the point of these interfaces is not, oh, that's a neat way to look at your data. Each of these is a new way of managing diabetes. Each of these plays a big role in the daily routine of whoever uses it. Diabetes is already DIY. From day one, when you get a prescription for a meter and some insulin, it's up to you how you're going to put these pieces together to build your own way of doing diabetes, your own way of driving the car. Which brings me back to the car. You're driving this car. You'd like to improve it in some small way, but you're going to have to hotwire it to do so. So what do you do? Do you worry about the car and how uncomfortable it feels to mess with it? Or do you focus on how much changing the car would transform your drive? Of course you hotwire the car, because it's not about the car. It's about the drive. There's this misconception. Those of us doing this DIY thing are the car fanatics. We just love our fancy rims. Most people are happy with the car they have, but we, we just got to tinker. It's not like that. We were sentenced to this drive. We don't want to be on it. We were given a car clearly designed by someone who's never spent time behind the wheel. <laughs> we happen to know how to open the car, so we do. And it makes our drive so much better that we must share it with others. Because it was never about the car, it's about the drive. It's easy to look at this jumble of wires and circuit boards and dismiss it. I made the same mistake when I first saw Open APS, and then again when I saw, uh, when I saw no, not Night Scout, and then again when I saw Open APS. That's focusing on you know, the finish of the paint instead of how the car lets you drive. It was never about the car, it's about the drive. Right now we're spending a lot of time down here and from the outside it looks really messy. But it's only because we have to. It's for the sake of all the moments we get back up here. Who will get us here? A pump which lets the owner securely authorize apps to access it. Whoever gets this right will win everything. Because people won't even be talking about the pump. They'll be saying they have the only pump which lets them try these 20 different ways of managing their diabetes, each with a novel take on it which no pump company saw coming. I'm eager to see who's the first to do this and ends up on the right side of history. Until then, we're driving these cars all day, every day. We strike our own personal balance between checking screens, pressing buttons, and living life. Getting to choose how we do that is not just a nice to have. You know those moments when you're driving on the open road and there's no other cars in sight? You can gaze out at the horizon and feel infinite. For a moment, all there is is here and now. You feel at once insignificant and connected to everything around you. Those moments are the ones people without diabetes get to take for granted. 
All we're trying to do is make those moments less scarce. And we're not waiting. Thanks. Industry, but I'm going to try and do it anyways. Um, I, I have a feeling that a lot of that, what I what I don't want to happen is for you guys to learn all this and then for that to just exist in a silo. So I, I want a back channel between open APS and industry. Like that must happen because there's so much good learning happening. And my guess is people in industry are pretty nervous about that from a regulatory perspective. And I like that has to be figured out. It has to be. So I don't know what needs to happen for that. Any, I don't know. Any vendors would like to volunteer today to work with us, we'd be happy to. Yes, yeah, so, so, we, so we regularly call all the vendors asking for open protocol access so that we don't have to do what Ben West did, which is spend six years reverse engineering the Minimed communication protocols. Right now there's a bounty. I think it's $13,000 for someone who can reverse engineer the Omnipod communications, which, like I said, it took years to do with Minimed, so we'll see who does it. I don't think 13K, 12K is enough. But if that's what the community is willing to do, what kind of story do you want to be part of as a device maker? Yes? Um, I'm just going to call for you know, everyone's assistance. Rather, you know, Open APS, amazing work. Reverse engineering, I think I've been speaking to Ben a ton about protocols and, and frustrations around uh, even if APIs are exposed, what does this data mean? What does it, does the nomenclature mean the same? Are we consistent? Are there authorization? Is there cybersecurity embedded in it? A lot of different questions around, you know, secure access, which I think a lot of the ma manufacturers are looking for, as well as wanting to promote the innovations through data standards, right? So I would just like to call everyone in this room, because I think everyone in the D-Data and We Are Not Waiting initiative is wanting to work together, but in both a regulatory aspect, a security aspect, a manufacturer at a patient's level, and you know, join together, maybe through you know, some of the standards organizations that I'm already part of, Maybe it is working together with you know individual, but again, I just a call for we get together twice a year, and aside from twice a year, it's crickets sometimes, and it's it's a little frustrating trying to promote standards and to tell everyone that this is a good idea to be interoperable and to be in an ecosystem, but twice a year isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. That's on. Yeah, and, and I would add, as a non-policy person, just as a software engineer, it's very obvious whether or not we've achieved this. It's binary. Are we doing the reverse engineering still, or can we build systems like this on top of what's already there? So it's one thing to have an FDA submission process where there's some kind of checkbox for you know a protocol documentation. It's quite another to say, yes, we do have it. That's, it's a simple check. because it's this group of people in the room who are building things. So like, if I sort of feel like saying like, if there's anybody who doesn't get it, like what's missing? Like what what is there left to understand about the vision that you just presented? And if it's just a matter of communication, like, and facilitating. I was talking with uh, some other doctors yesterday who are really excited about Open APS, like Joyce Lee, I'm sure many of you guys know her. Um, but I guess, at, you know, right now there's 81 people, it sounds like, using it. Like, at what point, is it at a point where we can start telling our patients about it? Obviously not like a medical recommendation, but like, hey, there's this community, you can learn about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not like officially sanctioning it, but they, they're doing exciting stuff, or is it still kind of limited to like the techie community at this point? No, it is. If it's 
not there, how far away is it? It is one hundred percent open to non technical people. The only so there's there's sort of a and Dana can probably answer this in more detail. There's a spectrum of like motivation to fix your diabetes and technical ability. And if you're very far on the motivation side, it doesn't matter how much technical ability you have, if you jump in the chat room you will be guided all the way through to having a functioning system. There's an MD in San Francisco who's using it with his one-year-old. Um, there's you know people in their 50s and 60s using it. Uh, yeah. Dana can probably give I'll just say, it. Courtney's over here shaking her head no, so the official perspective is probably no. But <laughs> this is open source, it is publicly available, so any patient who hears about it from any method who goes online can access the documentation, the source code, the list of what they need to make it, and they can make their own personal decision in concert with their doctor or not, but their personal decision whether they want to do that. So that's that's where it is, open source for a reason. And I think the, the concerns that we heard earlier from the FDA, the biggest one is is not modularity, right? Because we're actually doing the modular piece. It's the, it's the lines of who is responsible, the area of responsibility, right? And so any vendor that can help us solve that, I think you're not, it, there's not necessarily going to be a punishment from the FDA, right? There's actually an, a great opportunity for us to work together. Yeah. Because um, you're, you're actually helping to solve those problems. But for clarity, the person who's responsible is that N of one user who decides to build their system. So if you read anything about Open APS, it says there is N of one times 81. There are 81 individuals who self-built their own system. No one system in the room is alike. Um, so that's just an important takeaway point. It's part of personalized medicine, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there, there is not. We do not give anyone open APS. We give people instructions to build open APS, and it's totally up to you to decide how to do it. But it is available to anyone, technical or not. Now, uh, yeah, in the back. I, I just want to comment on that. Oh, oh, sorry. Courtney wanted to, to follow up. I'm sorry. I, I just want to say. I mean, I, I first of all, we come from a place of understanding why people are doing this. Um, One hundred percent of these devices are under FDA's jurisdiction. So technically, it's not legal to build an artificial pancreas device and use it without FDA approval. However, we have something called enforcement discretion, and we regulate by risk. So somebody building their own who has a lot of expertise, we may not choose to spend our resources doing this. Now, I'm not saying this is some sort of threat. I just want clarity around that and to know that ideally, we want a win-win situation. We want a level playing field. I mean, there's really no difference between a uh, movement developing a platform and a small company developing a platform. You know, and why does that small company have to do certain things and comply with certain things and a movement may not? So where's the right answer to that? We are definitely open to talking with the community about how to get to a win-win. How do we cover that responsibility piece, that patient safety piece, making sure adverse events are reported. Why do why might there be somebody who starts to build their own AP, maybe uses it for a while and stops using it? Nobody's collecting that information. Maybe they stopped because there was a problem with the algorithm that they're not nobody's collecting that information. There's no one entity that's responsible for collecting information about whether there's been an adverse event and disseminating that information to other users who might benefit from that knowledge. So um, I really would push the patient community to think about how to solve this responsibility piece and start talking with us a lot more frankly to figure out if we can, even if it's not the current FDA path, even if it's another route of meeting the, the types of requirements that are important here, we're definitely open to talking about that. So there's lots of um, ways to meet the FDA requirements that are actually in some ways the quality system requirements are what, so what we're What we're finding is the vendors are skittish because of the area of responsibility. Well, that's why the communication piece is key. And you know, I think that's actually why conversations like this is key. And I'm not standing up here to, to say you know, anything about what FDA will and won't do. I'm standing up here because I think there's a lot of rumors. And I would rather, I think we've solved problems more by talking together right. yeah. than, by, than by assuming you know, FDA will do this, FDA won't do this. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm standing up more to, to invite people to, to talk with me about it if you have questions and to encourage a bigger discussion between this community and FDA to solve the problem of how you get what you want and how we get what we need in a way that makes most sense. One last question? Sure. Back was I was going to go back to this last comment and, and apologize, I stepped in late so maybe you spoke about it, but so I just finished building an open APS rig. And Congratulations. Thank you. But uh, I think that the complexity and of building it, and it is pretty complex, and you need a lot of support from these guys to do it, but is a necessary part of learning how it works. Yes, absolutely. And if it were just a plug and play and push a button and it starts working, you would invite a whole host of problems. I think you can avoid by 
having it be complex and actually when I, it took hundreds of hundreds or hundreds of hours to do it, I had to rebuild it a bunch of times. It's complicated. But I think that's a necessary part of, of doing it when you're building stuff yourself. It's an important part of yes the documentation there, yes the community is there, but you have to apply yourself a lot to it. It's that self responsibility. Yeah, I completely agree. And if you go through openaps.org, there's a lot of there's a lot on these principles, right? You shouldn't use a system you didn't build yourself that you don't understand the failures modes of that you haven't spent dozens or hours or hundreds of hours troubleshooting yourself. And that's the approach we've taken so far for that responsibility piece. Thank you. This is quite say it. It was amazing. Thank you so much. We would like to thank Mark Wilson, Amy Tenderich, and Howard Look, in addition to all the others that participated in this live broadcast. It's not about the car. It's about the drive. This has been a Night Scout Foundation production. Come change the world with us. Learn more at nightscoutfoundation.org. In association with the Coexist Movement, let your voice be heard while you still have a choice. And in association with CGM in the Cloud, Open source, open data, open hearts. Caring for you and your loved ones around the world and around the clock. We now return you to your regularly scheduled life, already in progress.